Oh, error occurred. Go on. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. I am your host, Tracy Stuckrath, and in the whole month of um, where are we August, talking about um, wellness, and I am so excited to have um, Nina Curtis, Chef Nina Curtis, right there, whichever way I'm pointing. Um, she is the director and executive chef of Plantish and Company. Um, hello, my friend. How hello. are you? I'm good. How are you? It's so good to be back with you. Yes, we were just talking about it. It's three years just before COVID hit. I interviewed you for my Women's History Month um, right. segment that I started back then. Yeah. That's right. Time flies when we're having fun, I guess. Yes, we'll ma'am. And I don't know if COVID <laughs> was fun, but yeah, you've been you've been having a lot of fun with your career. <laughs> yes. 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 I'm blessed. I'm truly blessed. Well, and I, I was excited to um, learn that, and as I uh, we're going to talk about, I'm going to put this little thing up here, we're going to discover how sustainable and compassionate cuisine can be delicious and impactful. And, and part of that comes, um, you're a vegan chef, plant-based chef, but I, I really am excited the fact that you have just been, um, you were just at the White House cooking as well, a state dinner, and then you've just been named to the American Culinary core. Um, yes. So I want to learn about both of those things first and foremost. <laughs> sure. Thank you again for having me. Hello, audience. I hope you're uh, tuning in with us. We're going to have this delicious conversation. So let's take the American Culinary Corps first. Okay. It's a partnership with the James Beard Foundation, which I've worked with and work with, and then the department or state department. And they've collaborated to really be able to work with culinarians across the United States that they will call are exceptional with what and how they do things. And so it's really to use food. And I think it's quite, it's an interesting conversation to use hospitality and food and dining experiences, you know, in a diplomatic way. So they call us citizen diplomats and, and to the White House then, since I'm a member of, and there are about 80 of us, maybe okay. a little more across the United States. So we're going into different areas, but the intention and the goal is that we give dignitaries, foreign dignitaries, foreign visitors, an opportunity to see through the lens of food, through the lens of hospitality, through the lens of dining, American culture, American cuisine, and more. So, you know, we say we break bread together and we know that that's a coming together, um, a sitting down to the table, maybe um, letting go or talking more about our differences or our concerns. So it really encompasses this whole idea of at the White House, I'll, I'll go there. Uh -huh. So I was brought in as an American culinary corpse and I, I'm not sure how we were presented to First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, but I got a call and it was like, Dr. You know, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden has chosen you and wants to invite you to come to the White House for June 22nd. And, and this was with the visit in honor of the Republic of India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, who is a strict vegetarian. Okay. So first I was like, who of my friends, I have some really great friends, supportive friends that I first thought were pranking me. Like they're always, you know, we, we're always pumping each other up. Uh -huh. And I don't know if in conversations we've talked about, you know, what would be the epitome of where you'd want to cook or that question who you'd like to cook for. And so that was my first thought. And then I quickly realized, no, this is serious. The social secretary, <laughs> Carlos, they called me. And then things started moving really fast. So I believe that because my expertise, I'm going to say in this session, Tracy, uh -huh. is plant food. Okay. And look at, you know, I'm in Northern California and Sacramento is known as farm to capital. And mm -hmm. we're all talking about local and sustainable. I think in the 1970s, the whole West Coast of, you know, just this kind of California cuisine. People always ask, I don't know if you get asked, but does American, what's American cuisine? Well, it depends. 
which coast you're on, which it does. you're in. You know, I have yeah. people from North Carolina, Lumbee Indians. That's a whole different kind of look at food, right. local food, sustainable, et cetera. So in a nutshell, <laughs> I think <laughs> that was uh, how I got there. And then it just took off. That's so amazing. Um, and and one of the things that we last week was that that was last week that you did an interview or you were on a panel for La Dame de Escoffier, which I'm a member yeah. of. And I thought thought it was interesting that that was the first plant based state dinner ever. But the two chefs at the White House are female. And yes. that was first yes. time for that, too. Right. Chef Chris Comerford, who is the executive chef, first female chef in the history of the White House, and Chef Susan Morrison, executive pastry chef, first female pastry executive chef in the history. So we were, we had a lot of herstory going on. We yes. were making herstory, and it was the first, as they made it very clear, first plant-based menu curated and served in the history of White House state dinners. Wow, that's amazing. And and how did um, the guests take the food? Yes. Well, we had 400 guests. Okay. So we were out on the South Lawn. The previous state dinner had about 200. So, you know, when you look at the magnitude and you look at the people, I mean, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, that Thursday morning of the dinner, there were 9,000 people out front of the White House to greet him. Wow. Nine thousand so wow you know, in politics you know there's two sides of every story but with regards to my experience nine thousand people came out to show a lot of support and mm -hmm. so i would gather based on the things i knew that are kind of you know what we keep personal there were a lot of vegetarians attending the dinner also mm -hmm. I, the feedback I got was very positive. People were very happy, you know, when people are eating and they're happy and it's a whole orchestration. It wasn't just about a dinner. Dinner mm -hmm. was focal to it for all the things we discussed, but there was music, there was entertainment. So you could just feel the energy of the group was very high and positive. Uh -huh. And I, I, I lean into that with regards to then the food was good. <laughs> Because it can make you feel good or it can make you feel bad. Right. Well, very, very true. Yes. Um, the And what, and I'm going to find that because I know it's in the LinkedIn or in the Cater Source story that I have, but okay. the pictures of the food, because it was delicious. What, can you tell us what you served? Sure. And it was a three course menu. And I originally created 12 different items for First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, and her team to choose from. So okay. I first had to go out and do the tasting after we went through, you know, with the chefs that I worked very closely with online, on the phone, et cetera. After we got through the tasting, they distilled down the three items, which they said was hard to choose from because they Yay. liked many of the things. But that, yes, that um, led us to the first dish was a marinated millet salad with English cucumber, silver corn, which is local and seasonal, and then cherry tomatoes. And the UN had, you know, has declared 2023 year of millets. Oh, so really? Okay. Yes, yes. And India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi are really behind this. If we think back, I think it was 2013. That was the year of quinoa. So if yeah, we okay, yep. how that, you know, pushed quinoa out into the public eye, I think there may be some idea that this can be the same for millet. Mm -hmm. And millet is highly um, eaten in India, Asia countries and Africa. So I don't think people realize there's like 10 plus millets out there, larger like couscous or um, sorghum. And then you get into amaranth and fonio that's um, eaten a lot and mm -hmm. harvested in West Africa. The main millets that we get here are proso and pearl millet. They tend to be okay. a little bit larger. So it was very important to have millet showcased on the menu. 
I did three different millet offerings and the main one was the salad. So it was this marinated millet. We washed it, we soaked it, we steamed it. So it was very fluffy and then mm -hmm. we marinated it. So it had a lot of flavor and then it had a spicy avocado sauce on the base of the plate. It had okay. frise and arugula. We had edible flowers and we did this really beautiful basil oil. So that was a starter. Wow. And I'm looking at the picture and I'm trying to figure out how I can post that picture up here, but oh, I gave okay. the link to everybody. Um, okay. it, it looks delicious. It was so delicious. I mean, we had, you know, tasted it enough and then it had the red and yellow because people are like, what's then in that picture that's red and yellow. That was compressed watermelon. So the red okay. kind of represented the red of the United States flag and the yellow, the saffron of the Indian flag, because uh -huh. the whole this whole meeting was very important for the U.S. and India to really there it is. Know, commit and, and reestablish, I'll say, their bond and friendship and camaraderie. Yes. So you can see there the avocado spicy um, or tangy, I should say, avocado sauce on the base and then the millet, and then the frise, and the arugula, edible flowers, and then the watermelon. That's, and we compress so the good. watermelon yeah. because, you know, watermelon is full of water, and it would run, and you've got to be conscious of serving 400 people and having to have, imagine, 400 of these salads ready to go, but right. need them to hold. And that was something that I thought interesting last week that you said too. And and when meeting planners are planning events for 400 for 17,000, you have yeah. to think about chefs really have yeah. to take that into consideration. Yes. Last year, I just had a meeting yesterday. I was one of five lead chefs for what we have here locally. It's an annual, the Tower Bridge Dinner. And this year is its 10th year. And we construct a dining experience on this yellow bridge in Sacramento, and oh, 850 wow. guests attend. Oh, so we wow. build a commissary. You know, there, it, it, there's no close kitchen nearby. I'll say that. <laughs> so we have to really think about, you know, when you're curating menus, and I like to say this to people, because it's not just about, oh, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you make that? You know, certain, if you have something kept warm too long, it's going to lose its moisture. It's it's not going to look as presentable. You'll hear people say, oh, the meat mm -hmm. was so tough. Well, you know, it's not, you could have got the best ingredients, but what starts to happen when heat is involved? So we do have to think of those things. So that was the salad. And then mm -hmm. the main dish was uh -huh. a saffron risotto that we also then had this stuffed portobello mushroom with seasonal vegetables roasted and baby carrots and, you know, non-dairy. So it's not just about vegan. There are a lot of people that are lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. So we were able to still use non-dairy cheese that you can see melted really well. It was just very flavorful. We had, right. um, those were greens that when we did the tasting, we were able to take them from the actual garden at the White House, but for awesome. 400 we just didn't have that volume to, volume to pull from. And then roasted baby carrots, very tender, very flavorful. But again, I knew this dish would hold well and present well. Right. And well, then and the, the, I like the, the risotto was really um, hold, held together there. And then yeah. the carrots, I mean, that's a placement of putting those carrots there. They're not just slopped onto that plate. <laughs> No, 400 <laughs> plus and a little over, right? It's not right, just 400 exactly. for the guests. Yeah. Yes, we had um, took pictures. Everybody knew where things needed to go. But we had just for the first two, um, you know, we had a team of about 30 in the kitchen with us. We kind of every day started building up more people were coming into the kitchen and servers. I mean, we just really were a tight team. We were organized. And when you look at the plate, there's placement, like we'll say, okay, this is going at 12 o'clock. This is going at three o'clock. This is going at six o'clock. This is going at nine o'clock. So we all know exactly how it needs to go and then how it needs to be 
placed in front of the guest. Wow. So we're all seeing the same thing. Right. It's an exactly. orchestra. You know, it, it, you're putting on a, a an orchestration, you know, you right. want the symphony of sorts. So we really have to be tight and on our game. And that's a really big conversation between the front of the house and the back of the house. Huge, huge. So we had meetings with everyone and right. everyone got to see what it looked like. So communication is key because we need the people in the front of the house to immediately be telling us if something's mm -hmm. going on in the front of the house that we can't see and vice versa. And then, of course, we had people that had special you know, dietary requirements. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. yeah. So how did you learn and... a lot because okay. we had already taken away, you know, the main nine allergen type foods. Um, mm -hmm. So already I even considered tree nuts and those kind of things that we eliminated. And, you know, we had the dessert, which I'll get into was the um, cardamom rose infused strawberry shortcake which wow. is a dessert I grew up on as a kid. My mom made it a lot in the summer. So we had these beautiful, sweet strawberries. We made the cardamom, the biscuit, the short biscuit, mm -hmm. and then cardamom in that. Very subtle, but oh, wow. when you fit into it, you could recognize almost like this subtle aroma fragrance, right? So you kind of chase that, like, what is that? And then we marinated the strawberries in the rose syrup. So you can also see that we weaved in while Dr. Joe Biden wanted to present the best of American cuisine. We mm -hmm. also weaved in like a thread to build this tapestry with Indian spices and infusion awesome. of flavors and elements, but very, very light and subtle. But mm -hmm. it grabs that's a part to me that's very satiating and kind of like this. Oh, my gosh, what is this taste? I know this taste. I didn't expect it here. So, you know, you get people very right. inquisitive about what they're eating. We made coconut whipped cream. We have candied lemon zest. And then wow. we took pistachios and sprinkled them. There's edible flowers. And then on the other side, it's a, a sugar pool. And Chef Susan is um, really master at this. She made the red, white, and blue flag. And the yellow, That's sun, edible? white, yes, yes. And green, everything on the plate's edible. So wow. she made sugar pools. And then right here in the middle, it's like connected, showing the bond and the connection between India and the United States. So mm -hmm. all these subtle messages weave throughout the dinner that, you know, if you don't know, you don't know, but <laughs> it still set, sent a message. Mm -hmm. which now people are beginning to know the, you know, the meaning behind the intention or, and the madness. Imagine she and her team had to make a thousand of these each. Wow. Wow. Because we're going to break their sugar and we had the heat, although it rained. So the temperature was really nice, but you have to think of all these things, the humidity, very different in mm -hmm. DC than what, you know, I might be experiencing in Sacramento. So we right. have to think of all of these things, almost like an engineer, you know, this culinary engineer, like what's going to hold, what's going to present as our vision. And this was first lady, Dr. Jill Biden's vision that we're pushing out. So not a lot of pressure, not a lot of pressure. At all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It's not like hosting the XYZ convention in the Des Moines, right. you know, convention center. Right. Yeah. But the, <laughs> the word back and the, and the letter back was very pleased, very pleased with the execution and the deliciousness. You, do, you don't sacrifice deliciousness and taste and texture for anything. I don't anything right. in what I do. My dad's a chef and he'd always say it better be delicious. You right. can have all the nutrient density. You can call it healthy, but you know, I think we have to normalize healthy and deliciousness going together because so often they don't. So right. often someone's going to go, Oh, if it health, that sounds healthy. Well, what does that mean? And usually right. it means, Oh, that's going to be boring, but that's not the case. And there's no need for it unless someone is really on a, a strict dietary, you know, program because there's a real health issue. And so we have to be very conscious of sugar and salt and 
all the rest that I think our society is just becoming aware of more every day. Right. Yeah. I think so too. And, and it, when you re see the studies out there, you know, the more and more people are looking to know where their food is coming from. They, they are focusing on sustainability yeah. um, and, and looking at what they want to buy you know, food wise in that way. Um, and how, and this is just my, because my dad was talking about prices of eggs before I came up here because my mom came in. So can it be more economical for the plant? Is it more economical to eat plantish, plant-based? <laughs> right. I love that. You know, it's like the protein question. People always say, oh, it's so expensive to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. Well, it can be if you're shopping for products that are in boxes and the mm -hmm. marketing dollars are what you're paying for and the advertisement to eat a, a plantish, plant-based vegan diet. I mean, I didn't know about you, but the last time I priced grains and beans, especially if I'm buying in bulk or I go to Whole Foods and that can be a little bit more expensive or sprouts or Trader Joe's, what's local to me. Mm -hmm. It's very economical. I mean, we look across globally when we talk about food diplomacy and these whole foods, whole plant-based right. foods are what are really economical and can feed what did our armies, what has military been fed for the most part, you know, but we get into, if I'm talking truffles, well, <laughs> I know I'm going to spend a little bit more. It takes a lot more to get it, but it's the and thank you for asking, because I'm really an advocate of whole plant-based foods. Right. Just like someone can be on a junk food diet, a classical diet, as I'll right. speak of it. Someone can be saying, well, I'm vegan and eating Oreos or, you know, these accidentally <laughs> vegan foods. And that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for whole plant-based foods. We're looking for eating a rainbow. You saw all the colors on the plate. Yeah. And the combination, I don't know or if we missed a color in the rainbow or and if we added a color to the rainbow. So those are the things, you know, to answer your question, it's very economical to eat a whole plant-based food diet. And like you said, with eggs and milk and those things that really skyrocketed as we saw, um, you can do things and still get the nutrient density and not be putting out that money. But at the end of the day, you know, there's always those that are going to take capitalistic advantage of what we're dealing with as a society. So they can, I saw things that I would normally get. That's like a treat that went mm -hmm. up to $3. And I just said, no, I won't have that. Or I'll go home. I know how to make it. So just make it Nina. <laughs> But that takes time, Nina, and they yeah. they don't have a lot of people don't have your skills. <laughs> well, skills, one thing, yes, but we can all learn. There's you know YouTube, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> university, <laughs> but time is the thing. Time is the thing, and in the kitchen, no matter who you are, because when I leave the commercial kitchen or the professional kitchen, I come home and I'm no longer an executive chef. I'm Nina cooking her meal. So time for me is as, if not more, important. So I'll do batch cooking. I'll plan okay. my menu out. Even if I had a family, I would plan these things out. So things are more accessible to me. I mean, look at our society, how we're ordering out. And we're already mm -hmm. spending a lot more money in Uber Eats and others. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to be like aware of that. And I am a professional chef. I want you to come. I want to feed you. But I also advocate for teaching others how to make, let's say, restaurant-like food, since that's so sexy, in the right. comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. and, and I see that we're dancing. We've been doing this dance since 2020, really strong, right? But I do understand that people are out working, or even if you work from home, you're working. Right. And then you've got to turn off and take care of the family. So I really work with people to show them how to make it easy and then you can have add-on. So I've already cooked my millet, let's say, since it's right. year of the millets. Um, and I can pull that out or my quinoa or my rice, whatever you're really into. And then I can accent with my vegetables that I don't want to batch cook, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it's just organization. We say mise en place yep. in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That's everything. We spend most of our time in the kitchen getting organized. 
We do. So when it's time to serve and it's like fire, we can fire. If we didn't do that, we'd be running into each other in the back and nothing would get out. And so I think that's what we have to do in our own kitchens also. Because I come in and I miss everything in my own kitchen for myself. You know, I don't like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Because that's what cuts our time down. And then you mm -hmm. can sit down if that's what you do, you know, with your family and really enjoy the meal. Well, and I like the idea of the batch cooking. And there was an Instagram account month, years ago that I, it was a woman who was teaching moms to do that for the week. Yes. Like yes. spend Saturday exactly. or Sunday exactly. cooking what you're going to use bits and pieces of your menus for the whole week. Because then yes. it helps you streamline that those busy Monday nights when you've got the kids going here and there and, you know, everywhere. You I know? did that in college. I had roommates happened yeah. to be two guys and I would spend all day Sunday, put the music on. They'd be watching football. I'd make lasagna, all these things we'd love, you know, and then freeze it and label mm -hmm. it and everything because I was in school. I was working two jobs, that college student thing. Um, and I remember coming home one day and they both were sitting around the lasagna, like had heated it and just put some, you know, pot holders on the table, the uh -huh. coffee table, not even the dining room table. And just were going in at it. And in my head, I just wanted to explode because that was supposed to give us like eight servings and they were <laughs> devouring it while they watched a game. So, you know, then I really gave them the lecture. <laughs> Very organized and put the menu on the front of the refrigerator. Do not touch this until Wednesday at seven. Oh my goodness, that's hysterical. <laughs> Backfires on you. Did they ever talk to you again? <laughs> oh yes, they laugh yeah. about it. I, I, yeah. I laugh about it, but in that moment I was... You know, because I knew it would take us. I, I knew how right. we ate. And they were like, well, it's so good. I was like, well, well, that's a good thing. And was that vegan back then? Back then it wasn't, but it was already okay. less meat. I think I was doing like turkey. So okay, it was more vegetables than not, but it had cheese in it because back then in college, yeah. yeah. I've been a plant-based vegan for over two decades. But okay. Yeah. So it was okay. a long, a bit of while, <laughs> a while ago. They're hoping I forget it altogether. <laughs> <laughs> nope, that's not good. That's never going to no, leave your brain. <laughs> not. Um, okay, so what does um, sustainable and compassionate cuisine in the title of this, what does that mean in, in looking at plant-based or, and, and how can, I mean, you just produced a, a dinner for 400. How can we, emulate that at convention centers and hotels across the country. Sure. I think we all have an idea of sustainable, you know, mm -hmm. for me working in a kitchen that was well building standard, it was like low to no waste. It was really looking at as a, a chef that was feeding 1400 people in this case example, how do we look at our menu and then the ingredients for those items and, and how do we repurpose things so we can be a bit more sustainable in our dollars, in our food production, where we're getting our food from and how we can repurpose our food. For example, I just did a presentation this weekend in Kalamazoo and it was a advanced culinary medicine and nutrition summit. And I took hearts of palm and made ceviche oh, because wow. I was also presenting the blue zones and the longest lived people while they weren't vegan they were heavily plant-based and then you have these five different zones so they have their local foods and so i used this um inspiration of this hearts of palm ceviche from nicoya costa rica but i made three different dishes in front of my audience i used wow. it like a cocktail with crackers and then I took an avocado half and put a scoop of it and put some tortilla chips. And then I used it like a tuna, a scoop on a bed of lettuce that came from their five acre farm that wow. was around the corner and made a salad. So I was trying to impress upon the audience that was chefs, RDs, 
um, dietitians and doctors to really think about the menu you're curating and how the produce and the ingredients, no matter how you're cooking, can be used so you're not having all these different items, as we know, cost more, you could mm -hmm. lose more if you don't use it in time. And then in the kitchen where we use a lot of jalapenos, you've got to buy a case. So where we'd be almost halfway through, but I knew we were going to lose them if we didn't do something, we would half them, take the seeds out, and then dehydrate them. Oh, and wow. And then okay. pulverize that into a spice that people just went crazy for. I was like, the next step will be to sell it as its own right. jalapeno spice, because you rarely see that on the shelf, right? As a right. spice. So that's what I mean by sustainable when it's when we're looking at cuisine and we're looking at produce that doesn't have as long of a shelf life. Right. And I think in 2020, we saw a lot of um, food service entities shrinking their menu. Right. Right. So sustainable, like what's hot, what's not really keep the things that, you know, sell and move. That's sustainability to me, along right. with all the other ways we know sustainability works from working with your local farmers to how far is food being transported? How is it being composted and all else? So there's that right. bad with. The other thing with about compassion, you know, we can talk about a plant-based or vegan diet, but I did an event a couple of months ago and the producers of the event, it was at a museum. They wanted to bring me in as the vegan chef and they were gonna expect, they were expecting 900 people. And I was like, guys, be careful. Don't try to decide the percentage of vegans that are going to be attending because there are people out there that my offering was gluten-free, my offering was dairy-free, my offering was even nut-free. And I said, there are going to be people that pretty much know when they see the word vegan or in plant-based that it may better fit the dietary realm that they're in or the dietary space. And sure enough, that's what happened my offering sold out the fastest. First. Really? Wow. Yes. And then there were some vegans that came later and there wasn't anything available for them. So wow. to me means let's remove some of the labels. Yes, I'm an advocate for animal, um, you know, compassion for the animals and care and guardian and welfare of animals. I'm compassionate and an advocate for the planet we live on. I've said it before. I don't necessarily want to go to Mars. I want to stay here. <laughs> you guys do your thing. I'm compassionate for the people that actually do the work to get food on our plate that we in general may not want to have to do. And I'll leave people to think about that. So compassionate cuisine to me is outside and is larger than just plant-based and vegan. It is looking at compassion for, you know, I think we saw through 2020, I mean, people just showed maybe not their best side to food service workers and hospitality workers and compassion for the professional side is just as my museum example, being considerate of the people, don't narrow people down and label them. Be aware that people right now know that certain things, the way they're perfect, prepared for food service may mean I can eat that because it's dairy free. I can eat that because it's egg free. Mm -hmm. I can eat that because if it's said it's gluten free. So we need to widen our scope of compassion in general with the people that we're feeding. And, you know, gone are the days of the chef that's pissed off because <laughs> I've walked in the restaurant and said, can you take this, this and this out? Yes, we're artists and we want to express that artistry. And I would rather and respect if, you know, I see something, it's like a supper club and they're like, we will not be able to accommodate you if you're gluten intolerant or a vegan, whatever. I'm just like, okay, cool. I know not to go there. Right. I'm not going right. to fight about it. You have to do something. But today, I think most people expect that they should be able to go into, whether it's a meeting, eating at a meeting or- yep going to the White House or going to the cafe down the street from you or going somewhere for breakfast, a diner, that there be more options. Considerate, compassionate right. cuisine is considerate of a larger audience in my scope of work. 
I love that. And um, we've got a comment here that says, I love the com concept of compassionate food. So simple, yet so profound. I agree Thank with you, you. Rajari. Rishar yeah. I'm sorry for mutilating me. <laughs> and if you say vegan cuisine, which I say, and I, and I have no problem with it, or I say compassionate cuisine, that's an icebreaker. That's a conversation. That's a hook. Like what people lean in. What do you mean by compassion? If anything, I, we need to be a more compassionate humanity and, and human with each other of our differences. My mother and father are not vegan, but they're very compassionate about when I come into town, like, oh, where can we take the vegan? <laughs> And, and they know that I'm going to find things and my plate's going to look better. And then everyone's looking at it like, well, how did you get that? I didn't see that on the menu. I said, well, I looked at the menu and looked at the ingredients that I already know they have. So I'm not asking them to run out the back door and get something they don't have. I'm very compassionate in my request of my dietary needs also. So it works two ways. I, and you said that last week on the Dom's meeting, and I thought that was just so interesting that you, you know, because people with individuals with food allergies or celiac, they'll look at the menu online, see if they can eat there. But with your talent and your, you know, what you've got, you went to a non-vegan restaurant and said, oh, can you make me this? Because I know you've got this. And I, yeah, yeah. and you, you speak their speak as well. So yeah. I think that helps. Yeah. I have I a very that. good friend that's not vegan, but she has a list of can't haves. And right. then she'll start asking the food server, well, where are you preparing the meal? Like, mm -hmm. is your grill cleaned? And I went to yep. purchase um, an item just the other day. I was over in SAC, and it's a uh, vegan cold cuts. Okay. And the, the person working said, well, we don't have any. And I started getting into a dialogue with them. And I was like, but I called. I called the manufacturer. I called the store before I came. And they said, you did have it. And he said, then he went into, well, we have one meat slicer. And so we have to have that meat slicer clean and, you know, sanitized before we put the meat on it so that we can slice the non-meat. Mm -hmm. And my next question was, so you have it in bulk. It's just not been cut. And he said, yes. And I said, and there's no way to stop in the middle of your day in your production and prepare that meat slicer so you could slice it for me. And he said, yes. As a professional, I said, I got you. I understand. Can you just give me a pound of X and a pound of Y and I'll slice it myself once I get home? That's, and wow, that. yeah. Uh -huh. He did that because I have the capability of doing that. Not all guests or those that have spent their gas money now because they've been told, yes, we have it. So there was a gap break in communication mm -hmm. because yep. also the meat that he was getting ready, one of them to cut for me, had an expiration date the next day because they had opened it for someone. So you see where there's a problem from the manufacturer to the, the in-between person to the customer trying to just spend money. This was my right. third time in the store being told they had it, but I listened more intently and okay. I caught and I looked over and said, do you have it? And it was a yes. And then I changed my whole way of approaching him and leaning into him because I could do what I needed to do. I do have it. I have sliced right. it and I'm very happy, but that right. is not the case for the end user. That's just trying to get a product. So the manufacturer there has to be more compassionate with what's happening with the, you know, person that's mm -hmm. selling it or serving it or whatever else. So that's right. what I mean about compassion all the way through up and down the chain. That's, that's a really interesting thing, way to approach it. Cause I was also talking to a friend, an, another chef um, out of Louisville, Louisville, I need to say that correctly. <laughs> and, um, you know, about doing kitchen audits. Right. And it's, it's looking at it. She's like, you and I need to go together because I'm going to see one thing and you're going to see something else. Sure. And, and a chef being in their kitchen altogether, it's got, got blinders on, not for the fact of they've got blinders on, but because they're in there all the time, they don't necessarily see the opportunities. Right. 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 
No, it, it has to be a, a collective conversation of all right. parties involved to provide the best for the end user. Right. And that's well, what they can break. And I also think, too, the best for that worker as well, right? Yes, be yes, yes. Because yes. that compassion you mentioned a few minutes ago. Whoever yeah. the end user is to the manufacturer's end user is mm -hmm. the store, the account. Right. The okay. Yep. The vendor's end user is the customer trying to get in. Most right. often it's the, the customer end user, restaurant, food service, store that gets the short end of the deal. But the vendor to the manufacturer, this isn't working for us. Nobody's mm -hmm. ordering it. We can't cut it and then lose it. So, you know, everybody loses at the end of the day. Right. It, it kind of reminds me of an event years ago that I worked on and the, my client bought an event registration system and they designed it the way they wanted to sell their tickets, but they didn't think about the reporting or the actual ticketing at the end. And we were having to put band-aids on and re reconfigure everything at the last minute in the middle of the event selling. Right. And it's, I think the same thing with a manufacturer, right? You've got to think about that end user, you know, doing that. How it's being yeah, used. So compassion again comes yeah. back to like letting go of our egos. Right. You know, and, and not someone will say, oh, you're right. I'm not trying to be right. I'm trying to be efficient or I'm trying right. to be effective. It's not mm -hmm. about right. I'm working with you. We're collaborating together. So let's right. both win. Let's everyone right. win. Right. Exactly. It's, it's definitely that. Now, and I, one of the things I, I think I ask you in advance too is, you know, I've just recently done an audit and I've collected a hundred, a hundred menus from hotels and convention centers around the country that I'm going to audit too. But it comes down to that labeling thing too, but it makes it really hard for a meeting planner to order food when the menu's just put out there. Right. And there's no, there's no labeling of it. And right. how can we, how can we make that e that efficiency be more compassionate from both sides? Well, anytime I'm doing a catering, there's always labeling and ingredients mm -hmm. on a tent card mm -hmm. printed out um, with specifications of, you know, as the caterer, I want to know what are the guest requirements for the dinner at the White House. We knew right. what the dietary requirements were so we can meet those needs seamlessly with no attitude and make it as good, if not better as all rest. So I mm -hmm. think that is really important. But again, I think it's the communication from those that are the decision makers that sign the checks mm -hmm. all the way down to the front liners, which we are, that we get the brunt of it or we get, you know, and, and, and being able to listen and not take it personally. Right. So if you have 350 or so menus and, you know, you have to look at kitchen design and, and how we have to decide if we can do this and we want to do this and we want to say we serve everyone, have it your way. Like when I worked at Burger King in high school, <laughs> you know, or McDonald's, we were timed how fast we got it out. Wow. I've been able to take all of this from high school, time to lean, time to clean and bring it up to all these years of the fanciest places I've cooked. And those elements still distill down to matter. Right. So to answer your question as best I can from my seat, it's like, oh, well, I already do that. But I would have very specific questions I'd be asking you as the meeting planner of the needs of the guests. Mm -hmm. you know, and then what in reality I can do or right. what I might need to go outside and get. And that may or may not cost on your right. end, mm -hmm. but at least we can agree that this is enough of the audience that we need to provide for. And then I've got to have my team trained. And right. again, that usually comes from leadership. How mm -hmm. is the buck being passed? Right. How is the carrot being passed? I've got to, I have to be the one that is initiating this and excited about it. So my team is also, and I've been right. through hotels and everything else. I've had great leaders and I've had not such great leaders that, you know, for me, it's all been a benefit to define and come into my own of leadership. 
That's awesome. Because you, you do learn from your mistakes. You learn from oh, things you don't yeah. like to do. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. So based on the culinary core, based on your 20 years of even before that, working at Burger King to McDonald's, you know, my dad in the kitchen at eight years old, he was a catering it, chef. Listen, if I can work with my dad and I love him if he listens to this because I usually send him these type of things, but I just want to say he was a no, you know, like this is how it's done. Cut those onions. Don't look up until you're done. Don't put your tears in my onions. Learn to cut an onion right. Um, I, I can go out into the best and worst situations. And I was just told the other day, I have this way of making everybody feel good. Because I have a sense of humor. I don't uh -huh. take things too seriously. And I work to empower everyone to know that they are needed on this particular um, project. I don't use the term job. I usually say assignment or project. It, you okay, know, I like that. For me, because people are like, oh, complacent with jobs today. But assignment. Mm -hmm and projects and you've been chosen. I mean, I'll never forget hearing that call where they said, first lady, Dr. Jill Biden has chosen you. I sat up straight in my own house like, what are you talking about? Who's watching me? <laughs> you know, so I really have to keep compassion going, be lighthearted. My grandmother used to always say, don't come in my kitchen and cook if you're not cooking with love. You know, like that. Mm -hmm. So yep. I carry all of these things. I have my better days and my not, but I have my reminders that help me to, and I go throughout my day, I'm human, having attitude adjustments. Because if I just stump my toe, that hurt. And I want to <laughs> scream. And if you're trying to talk to me in that moment that I want to scream, mm -hmm. it may seem like I'm coming at you. So I, I'm quick to be able to adjust my temperature and tone and, and feelings throughout the day. Well, and I think that's everybody. We That's a good lesson to learn for everybody because, and for those listening, you know, getting that feedback from you, you know, having that interaction with you, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Right. Always. And Always. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's really, really important. Um, okay. So I, the next question I want to ask you is, with all of this, the future of food, and and I posted an article yesterday or the day before, is that at the at the, well, let me read it right at the conference of mayors. Okay, I don't know if you saw this. Fourteen hundred oh, yeah. mayors yes. signed the embrace the resolution to emulate um, New York City's model of plant based initiatives. Yeah. So, I saw that. with. With that in mind, I mean, is that the future of where we're going or, or or do you have other concepts around that? You know, that's one of the futures of where we're going. I was on a mm -hmm. panel in the end of 2022 and mm -hmm. it was from the conference that the White House held in June of 2022, the mm -hmm. conference that they hadn't held in over 50 years on hunger, mm -hmm. nutrition and yep. health. I listened to that. Yep. And then they were working with the Independent Restaurant Coalition and the Plant Based Association, the James ba James Beard Foundation, and, and the American Culinary Corps. Um, to and we had this whole webinar to really get restaurants, cafes, eateries across the United States to have more plant-based offerings. But remember in my world, plant-based or vegan also means compassion. That also means, oh, I'm taking care of potentially the gluten intolerant. I'm taking care of the dairy intolerant. I'm taking care of the egg intolerant, the seafood, the nuts, et cetera. So they are already working on it. So I, I think it's coming out now. Governor Newsom here in California last year passed with unified schools, that every unified school in California will have a plant-based offering mm -hmm. on the menu. And then mm -hmm. we have to look at the dollar amount that unified schools are given to serve even a lunch. That's another right. story. But mm -hmm. $700 million going towards that. So it definitely is a coming of. And I think it's exciting. I think you and I and others We'll find our way and, you know, have to meet with people that are a little maybe disgruntled with this thought of more. 
we right now as an industry of hospitality and culinary and eateries, I mean, restaurants are still struggling trying to get keep their doors open. I heard of two that just shut down. Daily. Yeah. I, I just mm -hmm. read a list and it's like in my alerts that come up to keep me going. So I know because I'll go home to LA and a restaurant has closed and it's just my regular thing to just go straight to the restaurant. And right. now I've had a couple of times where it has shuttered. And so now I'm looking before I spend, you know, I get in there, I either driving a car or taking Uber. So this is something, yes, that I think is getting more um, attention. I think with 2023 being the year of millets, they're really looking for millet to do what quinoa did. Millet's very different. Millet has a lot more op opportunities. That's very exciting. You know, so their technology, how is AI going to affect us? How mm -hmm. is, you know, food delivery going to affect us? How is the new model? And I don't have the answer. I'm watching and looking and identifying even how I work. How is this new model of what we have known as eating at a meeting, going into a restaurant to eat. How is this beginning to look? I did an event a month ago and I didn't do a charcuterie table that the, the um, host wanted. I did charcuterie cups. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I expressed to her, you mm -hmm. know, whether a guest says it or not, they're watching and this will be a more equitable, more sanitary and fun way because we took um, her label of a new a uh, book she was launching and put that on the cup. So we were able to advertise and get more impressions mm -hmm. out. So a lot of things are coming, but food is always going to lead the way. We need to feel feed hungry people. We need to give people shelter and everyone should be able to live in a warm environment and sleep in a safe environment. Food sustains us and food is entertainment and food does a lot of things. It comforts us when we're in distress or dis you know depressed. But there are a lot of other things that come into play. Food is just the core, like it was at the White House, like right. I am standing as a citizen diplomat. So while I'm very excited about all these things, I, I again, the word compassion is huge for me in 2023. Mm -hmm. Because before or until we have compassion for each other, um, we're going to always have these issues of hunger and kids not getting nutrient density either at school or home. And they're our future. They're our future. Yeah, they are. They are. And then, and just those kids that just won that lawsuit in Montana um, about for climate change, right? They're like, yes. yes. I mean, yes. I sent that to my niece and she's like, Oh my God, I didn't see this. This is awesome. I mean, but it is, it's, it's, they're the ones leading the charge. And sustainability and compassionate cuisine, that all goes into, you know, climate change, the environment, right. all the things we're talking about. I mean, look at Maui, all those things that we're talking about, we have to really, you know, whatever you want to call it, people realize there are changes happening. And if we don't get control of it, we're all going to be at some point experiencing it's really hot. I came back from Kalamazoo, which rained and it's humid. And it's on the East Coast. And I was like, oh, we're so arid and dry in Sacramento. And I fly in and it's humid. Oh, wow. And it's like 90 degrees at one in the well, midnight when I get in. And I'm like, what is going on? And the next day was very humid and we had had rain. So we have to, you know, really start paying attention to and identifying however we can identify with it. And do mm -hmm. our own due diligence, not just read an article, but go, okay, do people fact check anymore? I find so many unfact checked things in things I read. So, it, you know, I have a time of my day, usually later in the day to collect all the things like we're talking about and really comb through and fact check before I share out information just because it was written in print or now right. online. Right. Yep. That's a really good point. Very, very good point. Okay. So one last question, because we could talk for hours on we this. Could. And Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, I want to ask you, if you were a farm animal, what would you want to tell people? Oh, I love this question. And I am going to be a cow because I love, a cow. Okay. I love cows. They're such sentient beings. 
And, you know, my next would be a pig that's been proven to be smarter than dogs. And I think my Akitas were the smartest of them all. I, as a cow, would be saying to you, you know, I love hugs. I love laying down with you. <laughs> I love running and chasing a ball. I, cows I love, do? Yes. Have you seen cows no. run? They are like big kids, but you just have to get out of the way because yeah. they just like, you know, like goat, but they don't hop like goats. But, you know, when you've been on a farm, when you've worked around animals, not for their meat source, but for just them as pets, as we, you know, chosen to domesticate cats and dogs. And I had a parrot, I've had birds, I've had lizards, I've had hamsters growing up. I, I just, you know, I, I embody that feeling of when I see cows and they just love rubs and they love hugs. And I, I really look for our future that people come to realize again, again, if you had to do what it takes to get these flesh items on your plate, the question would be, would you, would you? Mm -hmm. And I believe a lot of us wouldn't. And these industries make it very hard to see between their steel metal walls. But for me, I leave you with just that compassion of this idea of this cow frolicking <laughs> in your backyard. And if you throw him a ball, it's gotta be big enough that you know he can really get or she can get a hold of it. I guess it would be a bull if it was he. But they're fun, they're loving, they're sentient beings, they have feelings, they feel pain. And yeah, as a cow, I would be saying, just be more considerate of me. And you know, if you have a lot of land, think of bringing me on your land and just letting me be one of your animals that love on you. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I think if people really saw, you know, we love the whales, we love the sharks, mm -hmm. and you see these shows on National Geographic or others um, that show just, you know, it's like the number of sharks that get killed, it's mm -hmm. outrageous in a year compared to the shark that's in the ocean minding its own business, and mm -hmm. it sees another moving, moving, it doesn't know it's human, it sees it's moving and that looks like food. Right. So compassion for me is wide, it's tall, it's it's large. And, and so I'm working on myself to be more compassionate every day. That's awesome. Thank you. And I and I really like that that thought process of it when we're when as meeting planners, right? Like let's be compassionate about how we're designing our menus, right? Mm -hmm. it, I mean, we need to be compassionate about our budget for sure, well, but we yeah. also need to be compassionate about what we're serving and who we're serving. So I love and that, that bottom line and budget. Mm -hmm. It's just a muscle we need to use because the more we know about the opportunities, whether it's economy of scales or when to buy something or, or even mm -hmm. talking to our, you know, vendors, um, we can all negotiate price, but we also need to support each other and think about those out there in the field, in the hot sun mm -hmm. that are working to deliver. You know, so right. when blueberries don't come in and blueberries are prevalent on my menu, I always have a second option that will be as delicious. That's compassionate. Yeah. Compassion. Compassion. Okay. That's a great way to end this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I always have fun with you. I hope everyone found this discussion to continue, you know, food for thought. Mm -hmm. And also get into conversations with people, you know, because that's the only way we're going to make a change. We can all watch, you know, eating at a meeting and, and love and agree or leave with, hmm, I'm going to think about that. I don't know right. if I 100% agree, but we are the ones that are already paying attention and we need to share that in our space and scope of people. And I do this with my own family and they're mm -hmm. always like, I just didn't see it that way. I didn't think right. of it that way. Mm -hmm. Of course, you didn't yeah. have to. Right. I've chosen to. Right. Chosen exactly. To. Yes. Yeah. So thank okay. you. You're thank you. Welcome. Everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone. Same time, same bat channel, same bat time next Wednesday here at 12 o'clock. Um, until then, stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Bye. Bye.